outreach program, which please robotics. Um, all in all, I am very, very glad to um, introduce uh, Josh to you guys. Please um, join me uh, welcoming him by giving him a big pause here. Thank you very much, Safwan, and thanks uh, to all of you for, for sticking around. Um, I want to also thank all of you. Uh, I saw most of the talks today and, and was really impressed by all the work going on here in the department. And congratulations uh, to all of you that presented and also all the grad students that didn't get a chance to present uh, today. I'm sure we'll hear more about your interesting work uh, next year. So uh, just before we begin, everyone can hear me OK? Yes in chat, if you can. All good? Yes. Yes. OK. Um, I can also see chat. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. OK. All good. So um, again, this is a Friday, Friday afternoon. I prepared a very informal talk. Um, it's been a long day. Uh, I'm aware of uh, Zoom and Teams burnout, so please uh, uh, sit back, put your feet up, and I will do my best to uh, entertain you for the next hour before the awards, which is right at four o'clock. So I, I will stop myself uh, at four o'clock. Um, I think, again, since this is sort of the, the end of the day, um, please feel free to stop me and ask any questions at any time. I, I can see chat, so feel free to type questions uh, in there or just uh, just unmute yourself and just stop me and ask questions. No, no problem. I don't mind being interrupted. In fact, I'd prefer it makes for a more fun uh, talk if it's interactive. Otherwise, I'll, I'll field some questions at the end. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk today uh, not about deep learning, um, and I'm also not going to talk about soft robots or crowdsourced robots or the robot you see on the screen. I will talk about biological machines and also some machines we've been working on recently uh, to help them understand language. Okay, um, so I, I loved uh, I loved the talk this morning, and for those of you that missed it, um, there was this uh, these eight uh, Heilmeier catechisms that were introduced, and this was a, a suggestion to you, the grad students, about how to frame your research and how to communicate that back uh, to your audience. Um, there's the list here. Uh, I love this. I hadn't heard of this before. Um, and I wanted to actually um, offer my own thoughts about how to how to pick research topics and how to pursue them, whether it's, uh, again, a class project short term or you're starting to write a research statement because you're applying for postdocs or faculty positions. How do you think about what's next for you uh, in terms of research? One of the things in practice that I found when I was a graduate student and also from the point of view of advising graduate students is identifying what are the limits of the current approaches that are out there, understanding those limits. And if you can understand those limits deep enough, you can often see new approaches that others uh, have missed. So starting with limitations, we could ask what are the limits of various uh, aspects of computer science. For example, what are the limits of current deep learning? And the answer, of course, is there are no limits. Deep learning every year seems to be increasingly powerful. For those of you that have just entered computer science or moving on with computer science, or just starting to learn about uh, machine learning and deep learning, it can be extremely intimidating. Uh, it seems like everything has been done. There's nothing left to do. I see that Chris has his hand up. Go ahead, Chris. Paging sorry, Professor Skalka. Yeah, sorry, that was an accident. <laughs> okay. okay. I was just like, I was going to drop in chat how horrified I am about, you know, deep learning taking over the world. But uh, Yes, yes, and yeah, also yeah, and also like... taking over the world. So um, research is hard. It is also extremely intimidating because it can look, again, like everything's been done. The only way you can make progress is if you work for Google DeepMind. But if you get into research and you're brave enough and you look behind the curtain, um, as you start to learn about deep learning or our other research branches with, with enough fortitude um, and looking in the right places, you can start to see which are, what are hidden assumptions. So my, my number one piece of advice for today for, for graduate students and for all of us is one of the ways to find interesting projects to work on is to find those hidden assumptions, which often the investigators who work on that technology are not really motivated to, to address or make clear. 
how to how to find those assumptions and then find ways in a tractable way to scale some of those assumptions back Again, difficult to do in very mature and powerful technologies like uh, deep learning, but they, they are there. Um, it's easy to look back on one's own career and, and sort of see, see that in one's own career. But I, I feel that one of the things that I have tried to do along the way, or I have learned to do along the way, is to look for some of those hidden assumptions uh, in my own home field, which is artificial intelligence. And the places that I have found those hidden assumptions um, is usually at the edge of, in, in my case, AI. So by, by, complete, uh, uh, by complete chance, most of my degrees were somewhere at the intersection between computer science and something else. Um, I did my bachelor's degree uh, quite a ways back now in standard computer science. As an undergraduate, um, Simon Haken, uh, who was at McMaster University at the time, gave a guest lecture in one of my computer science classes. For those who don't know about Professor Haken, uh, he wrote one of the uh, uh, one of the first uh, most popular books about neural networks. He was an early innovator in neural networks. I learned as an undergraduate that there was this sort of side branch of computer science that overlapped with neural science, where they were trying to create code that that seemed to mimic the human brain and could already do some amazing things even back in the, the 90s. So that was my first exposure to interdisciplinary research. I followed that up in a master's uh, degree in the UK that sat at the intersection between uh, computer science and evolutionary biology. That's where I was introduced to evolutionary algorithms. I did a PhD with Rolf Pfeiffer at the University of Zurich, where again, we were working at the intersection between computer science uh, and evolutionary algorithms and uh, neuroscience. And then working with Hod Lipson, um, um, dabbling in hardware, working at the intersection between AI and robotics. And in all four of these places, I found a lot of amazing questions um, that lay at the intersection of those fields and sp specifically hidden assumptions that I tried with my advisors to, to roll back. So where are these hidden assumptions? I'm going to talk today about the hidden assumptions in AI. Um, you may not be working in AI, but I would, motiv I would uh, challenge you to look for what are the assumptions um, in the field that you're working in. You may already know some of those assumptions and be trying to roll them back. What are some other assumptions in your field that are rarely talked about but are holding up progress? Finding those assumptions, I would say, is key to, to making progress. So far, so good? Okay, so where are the hidden assumptions in AI? Um, to, to unveil, uh, to uh, make them more clear, I'm going to use this uh, geometric metaphor. Imagine we have this one-dimensional line, and I want you to imagine AI algorithm as a line segment that is embedded in this line. Each point along that line segment corresponds to an agent that that AI algorithm is training. So that in that line segment, that algorithm is training agents that are points moving further to the right, meaning agents that are becoming uh, more accurate or suffering less loss according to a loss function. They're getting better and better at whatever we ask them to do. Before the deep learning revolution, most AI algorithms were stuck on the left side of this one dimension. They couldn't, few of them could do better than chance. AI, uh, the, the deep learning revolution came along, big compute, big data, some conceptual advances, and now we have deep learning algorithms, which are line segments that abut the right-hand edge of this one dimension, producing neural networks or agents that are as good, if not better, than humans, right? That's, that's the deep learning revolution. However, if we add a second dimension here, and where the vertical dimension now is going to represent st uh, tasks stacked on top of one another, we can still think of different kinds of AI algorithms as, one uh, as horizontal line segments embedded in this 2D plane, where the height of the line segment represents which task is being tackled, and in a somewhat hand wavy way, the higher the line segment is, the harder the task being tackled by that machine learning 
uh, algorithm. Now we could argue about which tasks here are easier or harder, but most of us would agree that checkers is pretty easy. That got solved early on. Natural language processing, that one is very popular uh, at the moment, and some would say it's on its way to, to being solved. Imagine now another machine learning algorithm, which is represented by a diagonal in this plane. Points lying along that diagonal are going to represent uh, agents or neural networks or robots that are being trained by that algorithm to become better and better and better at more and more tasks. This is particularly difficult to do um, for many reasons. One of them is known as catastrophic interference. If you train an agent to do a few tasks and then add a new task, as it starts to learn that new task, it usually forgets the task that it was originally trained on. So harder to create agents that are both more performant, moving to the right, and more general, moving up uh, in this plane. However, a lot of people in, in AI and machine learning would argue that just with more compute, uh, with more compute and more data, that's all we need and we will eventually get extremely general and extremely performant agents and reach this, this heaven of artificial general intelligence. Again, I'm characterizing things here, um, but a lot of people believe that's, that's basically the way, way to make progress, more compute and more, uh, and more data. The hidden assumption, which is not something that, that I unveiled, but many people before me have seen, which is this third dimension of embodiment. And embodiment is a concept that comes from philosophy and psychology. Embodiment means a lot of different things to different people. Um, for our purposes here, more embodiment is going to mean, uh, or the least amount of embodiment is going to mean a naked neural network that exists inside a computer cluster. It has no body. It has to passively wait for people to supply data to it, and then it's able to present some results back to the observer. As we march from the front of this cube towards the back of the cube, we are visiting agents that have increasingly more or increasingly more complex embodiment, going from the humble Roomba that has two wheels and a couple of sensors up to the Atlas uh, humanoid robot. So what happens if we create a machine learning algorithm here that is embedded along the grand diagonal? What that means is that points along that grand diagonal are going to represent agents that are hopefully becoming better uh, at a given set of tasks. They are gradually being exposed to more tasks as we mo move towards the top of the cube. And as machine learning is progressing, it is producing agents with increasingly complex morphology as we move towards the back of the cube. So the hidden assumption that most students in my group uh, work on and that I've worked on for many years is seeing what are the advantages of machine learning algorithms like this that not only work with agents that have a body that are embodied but that actively change the body over the machine learning uh, algorithm and how does that compare to algorithms that don't do so. As you can probably as you can probably imagine or, or you already know 99% uh, of the uh, projects in machine learning are focused on these kinds of algorithms and 1% or maybe less than 1% are focused on these kind of machine learning algorithms. There is a hidden assumption in these algorithms that embodiment does not matter. The body of the agent or even whether the agent has a body or not the assumption is it doesn't matter. Now whether it matters is still a hypothesis. We can uncover a hidden assumption, but that assumption may be valid. It may be perfectly valid to assume that we can throw away the body and create increasingly intelligent non-embodied agent. That's sort of a gamble that, that I took early on in my academic career and, and that we continue to pursue uh, in my group. So I mentioned one strategy to think about is how to actually identify and reveal these hidden assumptions. The other piece of advice that I'll offer is where on this risk curve to situate your work. Pretty risky to attack an assumption that very few people are working on, like for example creating machine learning algorithms in which embodiment 
changes. Some people feel more comfortable tackling more uh, risky projects that have the potential of higher reward. Others are more comfortable with and interesting in pushing forward the state of the, the art along well-established lines. Neither is necessarily better or worse than the other. It's important for you as a young researcher to think about where on this risk curve you want to, you want to live. Okay, so um, I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. So as I mentioned, in all the work we do in my group, there is this central theme of embodiment. We assume that having a body or having a body that changes will help the agent tackle whatever task or task we want it to, to tackle. We've looked at this before. Um, we've looked at this before um, in lots of different projects. Um, Someone says no video. Is that no video of me? I haven't shown any videos yet, if that's what you're asking. I definitely will show some videos later on. Okay, so many projects in my lab, um, self-modeling. So we looked, we rolled back the assumption of the fact that a robot stays uh, intact. What happens if this four-legged robot here loses one of its legs? That was an assumption, uh, or how to deal with that, the assumption that robots are more or less intact throughout their lifetime. We rolled that back in 2006 and, and uh, had a pretty exciting project come out of that. Uh, my PhD student Sam Kriegman and, and our colleagues at Yale, we've been pursuing that in soft robots. I'm not going to talk about that project today. I'm going to talk instead about our biological robots, a much more recent project, and also some robots that use their embodiment to try and master uh, human languages. I'm going to talk about uh, computer designed organisms uh, first. Um, this was work carried out with my PhD student Sam and his dog Luna there, um, and our microsurgeon colleague Doug Blackiston at Tufts, and the lab director at Tufts there, uh, Michael. Uh, Levin. Um, we published this back in January of 2020. There was quite a bit of uh, media attention about computer designed organisms for about two months until another small little creature known as COVID um, stole, uh, stole the limelight away from, from our xenobots, but such is life. Okay, so some of you probably heard about uh, xenobots. Perhaps some of you have heard about xenobots so much you're already sick of them. I'm going to focus on some of the technical challenges of xenobots today. Okay, here's a Xenobot. Um, that's Sam's thumb there for scale. Um, so you can see how small these Xenobots are. What is the assumption that we identified and rolled back in order to start work on Xenobots? The assumption was, is that um, in the field of synthetic biology, which is moving ahead extremely quickly, most synthetic biology projects, the things that are being synthesized or created, uh, are human designed. So uh, what you're seeing in this picture here is a silicone jellyfish. So uh, there's a little bit of silicone, artificial material, and some uh, heart cells which will contract and cause this soft jellyfish to move. This is known as a biohybrid because it is a hybrid of artificial and biological materials. Here's a more recent one. Um, this is a very small uh, biohybrid uh, stingray. Um, you can see it's got some soft silicone material. The metallic parts that you see there, that's actually gold. And then they grew uh, rat heart muscle cells on the surface and they genetically engineered those heart muscle cells so that they would beat in response to light. More light and they would beat faster, less light and they would beat slower. So light sensitive heart muscle tissue. If you approach one of these jellyfish from its front left, it will turn towards the light and exhibit the behavior of phototaxis. Okay, so back to the assumption. These are all human designed. What happens if we could teach a computer or an AI method to design a synthetic uh, organism for us? We, uh, when we first started working with our colleagues uh, at Tufts, they showed us that they could actually take uh, skin cells from frog and heart muscle cells from frog and reconfigure the skin and heart tissue into different configurations. And uh, they would put together just about 10,000 or 20,000 of those cells. And if they did, the heart muscle cells inside this thing would start to beat and contract and this little thing would move 
around, which very quickly got the nickname of Xenobots, which is a contraction of Xenopus lavis, or the African clawed frog, which these skin and heart muscle cells uh, were taken from. Xeno is also uh, dates back to the Greco-Latin root of, of uh, alien. So these are not, it's not, the Xenobots are not, a Xenobot is not a frog. Some would argue it's not a robot. Um, what is it? We could argue about what it is, but by rolling back this assumption that we're going to create this thing uh, by hand, uh, this brings us to how do we actually get a computer to make these things? Okay. So that's what we looked at, and I'm going to just, um, I, I, that's, what we, that's what we set out to do. Could we get an AI method to build some of these xenobots? Could the computer figure out how to reconfigure heart and mus heart muscle tissue to make a xenobot do something useful? So I'm going to walk you through parts of this uh, algorithm. Uh, there's more details at the uh, web URL you see in the bottom left there. And uh, I'm, basically this algorithm is made up of three nested loops. In the outermost loop, what we're going to do is first get our algorithm to train or design an, an in simulation a xenobot for us. We're going to take that simulated xenobot and build it in reality and see how well it does. We're going to take its performance in reality back into the simulator and based on how poorly or how well or how poorly it performed. We're going to improve or update our simulation, use that simulation to train or design some new xenobots, send them to reality, get information back, and alternate through this process. So in robotics, this is often known as sim to real, design or train a robot in simulation, and then send its controller to reality or send its entire body using a 3D printer. This is sim to real, alternating with real to sim. When we send something to reality and the agent fails, can we learn something about what was missing from the simulator and build it back in for the next round of sim to real? So we have this outermost loop that is alternating back and forth between simulation and reality. Inside simulation, we have this middle loop, which is going to basically run an evolutionary algorithm. Very simple. Um, here's a video. Let me know if this video does not work. Um, this is a video taken from uh, some work by Nick Cheney. I don't know if Nick is here on the call today. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Professor uh, Cheney is, is a, a new professor here in our department. What you're watching is an evolutionary algorithm. The evolutionary algorithm uh, consists of a population of, in this case, simulated soft robots. At every generation, what you're seeing in the video is the best robot in the population at that time. What the computer is doing is not just simulating each robot in the population, but assigning a fitness value to it, which is how well it does at the desired task, which in this case is just simply how fast the robot moves. Once the fitness has been calculated for each robot in the population for a given generation, the computer deletes the slower moving robots and makes randomly modified copies of the faster moving robots. And at the next generation, those randomly modified copies are simulated. Some of those child robots move a little bit faster than their parents, and we continue on. So. Uh, Professor Epstein used to teach a class here, Evolutionary Computation. Hopefully that class will continue. Um, at its heart, you can imagine this algorithm is very simple. Like you see here, it's not much more than six or eight lines of code. Very simple idea. Hundreds of different versions of evolutionary algorithms. In our case, we're attaching that evolutionary algorithm to a physics engine, and it is searching the space of all possible soft robots to find those that do what we want them to do. I'll just pause here for a moment. If anybody has any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask your question. So far, so good. I realize for many of you, you've probably seen some of this already, but for some of you, this may be new. Okay. All right, so how do we evolve these robots? I thought I'd talk about, this is sort of the only real technical part of this, of this talk. Inside this population of robots, each robot is generated by a generative network. Uh, I think Colin was talking about GANs earlier. There's been this shift in artificial intelligence away uh, from neural networks that only analyze patterns in data to networks that can generate 
things. You can either generate uh, a deep fake or in our case, generate a soft robot. In order to get our system to do so, we use a particular kind of gener generative network that's been around for quite a while, since 2007. These are CPPNs, or Compositional Pattern Producing Networks. How does a CPPN work? Well, it has an input layer. In this simple one here, we've got two input neurons, X and Y, and we have one output neuron called G. There is one weight, one synap synapse connecting X to G, and we can assign a single weight to that connection. So a three neuron uh, compositional pattern producing network. We're gonna take that network and it's gonna generate or paint a pattern onto something else. In my little cartoon example here, we assume we have an empty 2D pixel array. We visit the pixel at position x equals zero, y equals zero. We feed zero, zero into the input layer, propagate that down to the output layer, and the, uh, or the output neuron in this case. And that output neuron, if we have two inputs that are zero, there's a good chance that the output is also gonna be zero. In this case, we're gonna interpret the output as the amount of paint or the amount of gray to put at pixel position x equals zero, y equals zero. So we're gonna put zero gray at that position, which is white, as you can see here. We go to the next position, which is x equals 0.1 and y equals zero. We have a connection from x to g. Let's assume that the weight is one. 0.1 times one is 0.1. So we're gonna drop 0.1 of g into that pixel and we continue and we basically move this neural network across the top row of this pixel array and as x increases it's going to drop more g into the top row of this pixel array. I believe Mr. Aliong is having some some issues there. Everybody else can see my slides okay? Okay, all right, so um, that's a compositional pattern producing network. Um, if we alter that if we alter that CPPN, in this case we delete one synapse and add another synapse which connects Y to G, you can probably convince yourself now that for most weights that we could attach to this single synapse, it's gonna paint more gray onto pixels that have higher Y values. Okay. Um, in CPPNs, we can also uh, modify or evolve the uh, activation functions inside the CPPN neurons, and that can produce different kinds of patterns. If we add hidden layers and we start to uh, complexify the architecture of CPPNs, they tend to produce regular uh, patterns, but more complex patterns, and this is why they're called compositional pattern producing uh, networks, which is basically what this neural network is doing is composing a set of coordinate transforms. And even for a randomly constructed CPPN, we could assign random a set of six random numbers to these six synapses. It will not produce white noise. It will not produce a random pattern. It will produce, uh, it'll produce a random pattern in the space of all patterns that have gradients, bilateral symmetry, regularity, and repetition. So um, what's often done in our field is instead of evolving things directly, we evolve CPPNs, and CPPNs tend to live in a subset of all possible uh, solutions, which is the subset of solutions that have internal regular structure. In our case, what are the structures, what are the things that we're evolving? They're soft robots composed uh, of voxels or 3D pixels. You can see this particular uh, soft robot here. This was produced, you can see that there is, uh, n um, it's not random. There are collections of different colored voxels in different positions. I haven't talked about the, uh, the color of voxels yet. We can also paint regular patterns in, into structures of arbitrary dimension by adding a third uh, coordinate here, z. We can paint regular patterns inside three dimensions or four dimensions or n dimensions. In uh, Nick's work back from 2014 where he connected CPPNs with soft robots, he was painting inside an empty cage 
He was painting whether or not a voxel is placed at that position. So there are actually two output neurons in this case. One output neuron is treated as a binary neuron. Zero means do not place a voxel at this position. One indicates do put a voxel at this uh, position. And then the second output neuron outputs an integer uh, in the range one, two, three, four, which correspond to the four colors that you might have seen in the video. Red, green, light blue, and you can't see it in this picture, but dark blue. These four different colors represent different material properties for these voxels. So hopefully I can loop. Okay, I'll just let this run a couple times. Red voxels are meant to represent something like muscle. They actively expand and contract at a regular frequency. The green voxels also increase and decrease at a regular frequency, but the red and green voxels will expand and contract in antiphase with one another. The light blue voxels, which you might be able to tell from this picture, are passive soft material. This is the soft robot uh, equivalent of a uh, fat. And the dark blue voxels, which you don't see here, correspond to passive stiff material, which is the soft robot equivalent of bone. Okay, so just putting all of this together, we start by generating a population of CPPNs. They all have, each CPPN has different internal structure, which means each CPPN paints or constructs a different robot which gives us a population of soft robots. We evaluate each soft robot in turn in the simulator. And in the simulator, the computer assigns a single value fitness, how fast that robot means, moves, slower moving robots are deleted. Uh, the, the survivors produce randomly modified copies of their CPPNs. So you can think of the CPPNs as the DNA and the robot as the, as the organism. So far, so good. No questions? Again, for some of you, this might be somewhat familiar. OK. So okay. I, question. Yeah, so I, I'm noticing that there's, well, at least I, with most of these simulations, I haven't actually seen any dark blue. And ah. I'm wondering if, if that's, uh, I don't know, is, that ever, is it just phased out with the machine learning algorithm? Or I mean, yeah. I don't know. I just, any, any thoughts as to why that never exists? Uh, that, that's a great question. And uh, the, the author of this work, Nick, is probably he, somewhere here on the call and could probably answer this better than I could. Right. What, what happens is, remember that we've asked the computer to evolve robots that just move as quickly as possible. If the only thing you need to do is move quickly, the best thing to do is to become a big ball of muscle. Remember that green and red are muscle cells. You don't need fat, which is the light blue uh, voxels, and you don't need bone, which is the uh, dark blue voxels. So we've given, we've given evolution four different Lego bricks, and it's figured out that it only needs two of the, the four. So Nathaniel, that was a great point, because again, one of the reasons why we use an evolutionary algorithm is that um, often the evolutionary algorithm finds solutions which are non-obvious, but in retrospect seem obvious. So I can now say, yeah, it's obvious you should be a ball of muscle if you want to move quickly, but I, I can't speak for Nick, but I, at least for us, it, it isn't always obvious. Uh, it isn't always obvious beforehand what evolution comes up with. It's but one of the reasons why you want to use it. It comes up with solutions different from what a human engineer might come up with. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, cool. Great, okay. Okay, so again, this, this idea has been around for quite a while. Um, we started a, a DARPA-funded project with our colleagues at Tufts, and early on in that project, um, the microsurgeon Doug Blackiston showed us something like this, uh, actually showed us the image that you see in the bottom left. This is him actually building a Xenobot sculpture. Um, you can see that he's got these very, uh, these very microscopic uh, uh, pliers. He also has a micro-cauterization micro device where he can burn away some of the, the tissue. What you're looking at here, that white material, that is just uh, frog skin cells that were harvested from early frog uh, embryo. So he takes them out, basically pulls them off of a very, very early frog embryo. Uh, they basically congeal back into a sphere of spheres, and then he can cut and scrape and, and prod and pull them 
and he created basically a sculpture, a one millimeter wide sculpture of one of our simulated robots that we had showed him on the call the week before out of frog skin cells. The moment we saw that, that obviously again rolled back some of these assumptions about what's possible with this kind of technology. It had always been assumed that evolutionary algorithms that were designing these things in simulation were eventually going to be sent to reality and built out of metal and plastics and ceramics and basically a, a, ro a traditional robot would be built from the evolved simulated design. This suggested that that doesn't have to be the case. We might be able to take one of these simulated designs and build it out of frog cells uh, instead. Okay, so what you just saw was a Xenobot sculpture made of just frog skin cells. Next time around this loop, um, they told, uh, our Tufts colleagues told us that they could, they could include uh, muscle tissue so that we could, they could put muscle tissue at different places inside a Xenobot. And like you saw in the simulation videos, that tissue would start to pulse, um, would start to expand and contract. The caveat, which we learned after a third round through this loop, is that when you take frog heart muscle tissue and you do not put it together in the shape that the quote-unquote frog is expecting, which is an adult frog heart, put it together, reconfigure it into a different shape, those different parts of the heart tissue will start to pulse seemingly at random. So uh, this makes things very difficult from a design perspective for the following reason. Let's say that I asked you to design the shape of a boat and you could put, you were going to put human rowers into this boat, but when you put these human rowers in the boat, wherever you want it and however many of these rowers you want it, they will all row at more or less the same frequency, but they will not row at, with the same phase offset with one another. Or maybe there would also be differences in frequency. They're all going to kind of do their own thing but you want the boat as a whole to go straight. What is the shape of that boat? So far, no one's been able to answer that question. Maybe one of you is able to figure out this problem, but basically what you need to do is build a machine out of Lego bricks where, some, where the behavior of the Lego bricks is pretty noisy. So this is a particularly difficult thing for humans to do, but the evolutionary algorithm came up with a solution, and again, this was work done by my PhD student, Sam Kriegman, which, who's on the call here. Uh, Sam ran this evolutionary algorithm for quite a while on uh, UVM supercomputer, the VACC, and eventually got back several champions or candidate designs. The best one, in the end, ended up being the one that you're going to see in the top part of this video. You'll notice before I start the video here that there is uh, green and red voxels on the ventral surface or the bottom part of this simulated Xenobot. Th they're going to flash red and green um, as, you see, as you'll see in a moment, but they are going to flash out of phase with one another. These are our human rowers that are not syncing up and contracting or expanding together, which they will do in a frog heart, which is what you want a heart to do in order to pump blood. You'll notice that in this case, uh, there was some passive tissue that was put on the, um, on the top, dorsal or top part of the Xenobot. So for a moment, if you just pay attention to the top half of this video, you'll see that although the heart muscle tissue is moving randomly, the robot moves more or less straight from the left to the right side of the video. If you now watch the bottom half of this video, you'll see Doug Blackiston, who built uh, that Xenobot according to Sam's evolved specifications. And the physical Xenobot moves more or less like the simulated Xenobot. The shape is not perfect, and its way of moving is not perfect, but close enough. And we demonstrated in this paper that, that the match was close enough that you could conclude that this design is basically crossing the sim to real gap. The reason we knew that is if we took the physical Xenobot and turned it, uh, put it on its back, as you'll see in the bottom half of the video, the Xenobot no longer moves. So that means that the movement is due to the shape and the shape was evolved in a physics engine on a supercomputer. So this was uh, something quite new. This was the first example of a self-moving 
organism, robot, biological robot, whatever you want to call it, that was not evolved naturally. Uh, it was not evolved naturally on Earth. It was something that was evolved in simulation on a computer. Okay, that's all I'm going to see, say about Xenobots. I'm going to switch for the last 15 minutes or so and talk about uh, language. Any questions about the Xenobots before I move on? Uh, somebody has their hand up. Sorry, I can't see who it is. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Jen Carson. Hi, Jen. Hi. Um, so are you ready for an interdisciplinary question? Go for it. Okay, so coming from the arts, uh, this is sort of a philosophical question, but are you thinking of the Xenobots as analog or digital? Ah, oh boy, that is a good question. I would say they are both. You can see in the video that they are digital in the simulation. The, the uh, evolution is only able to place a voxel or not place a voxel. It can't kind of place a voxel. So the shape of these things is definitely digital. But when we build it, obviously when we're building anything in nature, it is, it is analog at a certain scale. At our scale, looking down on this thing, it looks like a blob and it's moving in a continuous manner. But obviously if we zoom in closer, we see individual frog cells and those are digital. You either have a cell at a certain place uh, or not. You keep going into the cell of the frog. DNA is definitely digital. You have A, C, G, uh, and, uh, and T. Um, so the, the genetic code that specifies the construction of these cells is digital. So uh, it, is, it is clearly a mixture of, of both. Great question. Great, thank you. Any other questions? No, okay. All right, uh, I'm going to switch to a completely different project now. This is work carried out by uh, an undergraduate student here at UVM, David Matthews. I don't know if he's on the call today. I have yet to get a picture of the front of David. There's the back uh, of David. Uh, I'm going to talk about some work David and I did uh, last year on, a, again, a completely different project. This has to do with language. But the assumption here, again, is going to be uh, the hidden assumption in most work in language, as I'm going to show you in a moment, is a disregard of embodiment. What happens if we roll back that assumption and consider the relationship between language and the body? That's what we're going to explore in this project. I love this project. Most of this, the ideas in this project were all David's. So um, all of the wonderful ideas that you hear in the next 15 minutes are due to David. Any errors or inaccuracies that I mention are my mistake, not David's. Okay, let's talk about language. This has been something that's been at the forefront of AI research since the beginnings in the 1950s. Um, this is one of the first uh, chatbots. This is uh, Eliza, the computer therapist. Um, you could chat with Eliza back in the 1970s and she would say something like what you see uh, here. Okay. Um, one interlocute, one of the speakers is a human, the other speaker is Eliza. You can probably pretty quickly figure out which line is Eliza, which is the machine, and which is the human. Eliza does not pass the Turing test, but she was pretty good to the point that she seemed amazing to most people at the time. That was the 70s. Fast forward 50 plus years to this year. This is the state-of-the-art chatbot at the moment, otherwise known as GPT-3. Most of you have probably heard of this. GPT-3 is, again, incredibly sophisticated, very accurate, can fool a lot of people, but it definitely has its weak spots, and you can see it making some obvious mistakes here. Not only is it making obvious mistakes, but it doesn't indicate in any way that it knows that it's made a mistake or that it's made a silly mistake. Okay. This is not to denigrate GPT-3, it's an incredible advance in NLP, but it has these weak spots. Why does it have these weak spots? I would argue one of the, one of the weaknesses of GPT-3 in a lot of modern NLP methods is they disregard embodiment. GPT-3 has no body. It's a disembodied algorithm running on, a, on OpenAI's cluster, passively receives text, analyzes it, and then generates text of its own. Okay. So this idea of rolling back this assumption that maybe we should consider the relationship between the body and language, there is evidence to support the fact that it's worthwhile to roll back this assumption. 
from recent findings in neuroscience. So how do we know if follow, rolling back an assumption that we've identified is worth doing is because other uh, neighboring disciplines suggest that in those neighboring disciplines that assumption doesn't exist. So we are pretty good at generating language and understanding language and we have a body and it turns out or it's turning out to be the case that these seem, these two things seem to be intimately connected with one another. Here's one example. Um, so Pulvermuller, uh, Pulvermuller and his colleagues uh, put human subjects in brain imaging devices, fMRI. They were asked to stay still, not move, and just passively listen to language, to stories. It turns out that as they listened to stories, when certain words were, in, were, uh, were heard, like talk, lick, grasp, pick, walk, and kick, the part of the brain known as the motor strip, which goes about here, so if you're, wearing, uh, if you're wearing Bose headphones, where the strap would be on your head, right under that strap, that's the motor strip. It turns out that if you, for example, uh, clap your right hand, the left side of your motor strip lights up. If you clap your uh, left hand, the right part of your motor strip uh, lights up. If you clap your hands, one part of the motor strip lights up. If you uh, tap your toes your feet, or you do things with your feet, the other part of your motor strip lights up. If you're acting, if you're sitting quietly and you're listening to words that have to do with the legs, like walk and kick, the leg part of the motor strip lights up. So there's this amazing finding that doing something with a part of the body, is all, that same part is lit up when you hear things that have to do with that part of the body. So a lot of findings like this, they suggest that there is some relationship between the body and language in the brain. It's not really understood yet what that relationship is, but it suggests maybe that a good way to make machines that understand and process language is for those machines to also connect their body with language. So that's what David and I set out to do. We wanted to create robots that understood language and use their body to do so. So let me talk about robots for a moment. Here's a very, very simple robot here. We're looking at this robot from above. It has two wheels at the back and two light sensors on the front. One light sensor front left, the other light sensor front right. The left light sensor is connected to the left wheel. The right light sensor is connected to the right wheel. If you build a robot like this out of Legos, which you can do relatively easy, easily with some simple electronics, and you come at this robot with a flashlight from the front light, uh, from the front right, that means that there's more light falling on the right sensor and less light falling on the left sensor, which means there's a stronger signal being sent to the right wheel than to the left wheel, which means the right wheel will spin faster than the left wheel, and this robot will turn away from the light. So one robot, two light sensors, two wheels, two synapses, if you like, two wires connecting the sensors to the motors. No language here at the moment, but we have behavior. We have a robot that will run away from light. You can take those uh, wires and cross them instead. Left connects to right wheel, right sensor connects to left wheel, and it'll chase the light. Make modifications inside the robot to alter behavior. How can we exploit this for understanding language? So David looked at a word to vec, which is now perhaps an outdated uh, type of word embedding. Word embeddings are fascinating. Um, they're trained by Google or other big uh, machine learning outfits so that at the end you have a neural network and that neural network can take as input a string like walk, run, or halt. And that neural network will spit out at its output layer a vector. So in a word embedding, what that means is that for a set of words, there are corresponding vectors. In good word embeddings, the semantic distance between words matches the uh, Euclidean distance or the actual distance between the vectors associated with that word. So what does that mean? If we take the words walk and run, most of us would agree they're semantically similar. They mean similar things. They're close to each other in terms of meaning. And it turns out that the vectors associated with walk and run are also relatively close to one another. The word halt, if you ask most people, they'd say halt is, if you take these three words, it's the odd word out. Halt is further from walk and run than walk is from run and run is from walk. Yeah? 
Okay, so uh, these vectors are usually high dimension, like 200 dimensions, but for my argument here, we're gonna just assume two dimensions. Okay, so we have this nice uh, embedding. We would like to preserve it in robots. We would like the robots to act similarly when they hear walk and run and act very differently when they hear this third different word. How do we make that happen? So David did that by adding, taking these uh, the vectors associated with each word. So let's say we take the vector associated with walk and we feed it into this robot so that the robot is receiving the walk vector and it's also receiving information from the outside world based on its sensor. So it has its, in this case, two light sensors. You can imagine it has an auditory sensor or an ear in which it hears numbers, which are the numbers from the vector associated with walk, and light information. Given that input, it's going to flow from the sensors to the motors. We have more than two wires here. This is just a cartoon. But we have the light and vector word-to-vec information flowing in, causing the motors to do something, causing the robot to move. We evolve the neural network inside this robot so that it does, uh, it does what it's supposed to do. So in the case of run, for example, we want it to move quickly and run or move quickly away from the light sensor. So imagine we feed in uh, run and the robot actually does what we want. It turns and moves quickly away. If we look at the values of the sensors while the robot is running away, we can take the two values, the two final values of the sensors S0 and S1 and plot that point and that gives us another vector. This is the vector not associated with the word according to word to vec. This is the vector associated with this word according to the robot. This is what run means to this robot. When the robot hears this vector, it produces this time signature of sensation. Okay, let's say we take each robot in the population, we evaluate each robot twice, uh, sorry, we evaluate each robot three times, we put it, we put it in the center, we feed in the word, the word embedding for run, turn on the light, see where it ends up, put the robot back in the center, feed in the word to vec for walk, turn on the light again, see where it goes, put it back to the center, feed in the word embedding for halt, see what the robot does, and we assign a fitness value, which is the average of these three fitness values. How well did it do when it was told to run? How well did it do when it was told to walk? And how well did it do when it was told to halt? Okay. Can now ask the following question. What happens after this evolutionary process? We've evolved a robot that successfully runs. It goes quickly away from the light. It successfully walks. It goes away from the light slowly and it halts when it's supposed to halt. What happens if we feed in a fourth vector that this evolved successful robot has never heard before and that word is a synonym with a word it's already heard before? No more evolution, no more training, we're done with learning. Here's a word you've never heard before, go. What do you do? What's the chances that it's going to do what we expect it to do, which is act similarly? Well, let's have a look. Here's David's, uh, here's some of David's results. Here's a quadruped that was fed in the word uh, forward, and forward in this case is towards the red pyramid. So forward is kind of to the right here. This is an evolved robot. You can see it successfully moves forward when it hears the vector for forward. Take the same robot, feed in the word embedding for backwards, which you'll see in a moment. So same robot. We've trained this robot when it hears backwards that it also goes backwards. It's able to do both. Same robot, it's also able when it hears the word uh, stop or cease, or stop in this case, that's what it does. So it, it's doing forward, backwards, and stop. What happens now at the end? We have this evolved robot. What happens when we feed in the word uh, halt that it's never heard before? It does a similar thing. Okay. For many of you, that might seem obvious, right? Halt is a synonym for stop. Why, why wouldn't it do the same thing? 
turns out that that's not necessarily so obvious. If you think about uh, a robot, it is a dynamical system. Those of you who know about dynamical systems, it's something that's looping over and over again. The robot senses something from its external environment, pushes that sensation through its neural network. The motors move, causes it to change its relation to the environment, which produces new sensation, new motors, and around and around you go. And if we write this out, uh, if, and you can imagine that this, if it's a linear system, then at similar initial conditions will produce similar trajectories in sensory space. However, most robots interacting with their environment uh, are not linear. Most interactions are nonlinear because we want the robot to do more than one thing. If we want this ro simple robot here, it might, it's not even able to walk or run actually. So if we start to add more things for it to do, we add more complexity to the body. And that usually creates a non-linear uh, dynamical system, which means we can't guarantee that under similar conditions it's going to do similar things. What David found is that for different bodies, for different morphologies, they have this property. Some of them are able to obey words they've never heard of before, and others are not as good at that and it's a function of the body. So David was one of the very the second researchers ever to demonstrate that a robot could obey a word it's never heard of before, but he also showed in the same paper that it depends, its ability to do so is related to its body. Okay, I think I've run over my time, or we have four minutes left. It's a lot of information in uh, 56 minutes. I'll stop there and take uh, one or two questions before the awards. Thanks, Bert, thanks very much. Chris, do you have a I question? I do actually have my hand up now. Okay, yeah. go for it. <laughs> um, so this actually doesn't have to do uh, with the technical aspects of your talk, but maybe for the benefit of, of the students especially, you know, I think one of the, uh, one of the signatures of, of your work in, in many cases are these amazing collaborations you do, uh, you know, this with these folks, uh, you know, at Tufts being the latest example. and. I guess I'm wondering in your, you know, in your career and your strategy and your approach to your research, how do you meet these people and how do you make uh, these connections uh, yeah. to, to, across disciplines? Yeah, it's a great question. So, like I said, I've always tried to work at the edge of my discipline. So, when we published the paper in Science back in 2006, it was a robotics paper, but a lot of the language that we used in there was about neuroscience. How does a injured human think about its changed body and recover? So the way we write our paper, there's usually hooks in that paper that would be of interest to a neuroscientist or a biologist reading, reading that paper. So we try and write papers that are you know, interesting to computer scientists or roboticists, but we're definitely signaling that we're trying to understand what's going on at the edge of these disciplines. And in a lot of cases, we just got emails out of the blue from people who had read our paper and wanted to work, did similar things. So in the case of the Tufts group, they actually uh, damage organisms and observe how the organisms regenerate limbs, very close to what we, we do with our, our robots. So basically that's it. We're sort of putting out bait in our paper to colleagues that work at the edge of what we do, and, and that often leads to, to fruitful collaborations. Thanks for the question, Chris. Thanks. Any other questions? I uh, I, I I have a question. Um, uh, thank you for the talk. It was excellent. I actually I took your class uh, a couple years ago, so you know I, I'm a, I'm a little bit familiar with this, but the. Um, what I was curious about with the Xenobot, mm -hmm. and someone had brought it up before, is that there was no hard tissue that formed in the robot. And from my very limited knowledge of, uh, you know, how I guess the human body works, is my understanding was that, um, you know, our bones allow us to be somewhat more energy efficient because they almost act as like levers for the muscles. And I was wondering if you have thought about or um, 
if it's if it's even worth it, I guess incorporating like an energy cost component here and seeing if like a different morphology evolves because it also has to move efficiently as well. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, nice to nice to hear you again, Connor. So that's a biomechanics question. So if you're this big. If you're one millimeter across, you don't need bone. You don't need rigid material to hold yourself up. But if you are, you know, a meter wide or a meter tall or several meters tall, you need scaffolding. You need structure just to hold up your own body weight. Forget about being energy efficient. So we could ask the question, what are the, if we start to evolve larger and larger xenobots to do different things, under what conditions does evolution start to have to use additional building blocks like bone? Or if the, if the task is complex enough, maybe it needs to use a different type of Lego brick, which is neurons and synapses. So instead of making assumptions about what the robot is going to look like, or the biological robot is going to look like, let evolution rediscover or discover in new ways what are the right materials for the, for the job at hand. Yeah. Great question. Thanks, Connor. Any other questions to Josh? Very great talk, uh, Josh. I, I really I enjoyed every single sentence there. Um, Thank you. Please, everyone, unmute and give Josh a big applause. <laughs>